we're declaring something very special, very significant in the life of, of the believer, of the Christian, the disciple, the person who wants to follow Jesus. So I just want to take these next few minutes come to the point of saying, why, why is it so important to us? Recently, in an elders meeting, we were discussing this area of baptism and saying it's been a while since we actually did any teaching on it and talked about it. And so under our Google God series, I hadn't had any responses early on, so I thought, well, let's put baptism in as, as, as one which we know is a question which is significant to God and talk about it. And then when Jade and Julia saw that um, this was coming up, I, I think they probably thought there was a baptism plan. We were just going to talk about it, but they said, well, we want to be baptized. So they said, well, let's do the demonstration and the talk, and let's put it all together. And so that's really what we, what we want to do today. Now, I appreciate that different church traditions have different uh, understandings on, on baptism. And so today I'm not wanting, we're not, we haven't got time to debate all that. I don't want to debate it because I think for, for each church tradition there is a significance as to why they, they do what they do. And I just want to briefly explain why we do it that way here at the Lighthouse Church. One of the unfortunate descriptions of baptism as we have just witnessed is it is often termed adult baptism. And I think that might be just di differentiating it from infant baptism. I think it's unfortunate because really it's not just for adults. This baptism, it's not just for adults, but it can be for young people, can be for children. So I like to, I prefer to call it believer's baptism. I think that's a more appropriate name for it, a description of it. And so we want to just briefly talk about it this morning. So first of all, we, we see that it was demanded in the Gospels, in, Acts, in Matthew chapter 28, and verse uh, 18, 19, 20. Jesus said, one of, the, one of the last things that he said to, to the disciples before he, before he left was that they would go into, go into all the world. He said, Jesus then came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has given me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What Jesus was saying there, as you go as a disciple, make dis as you go out, make disciples, and as you're making disciples, one of the first things we want you to do with, with disciples is to baptize them. It was a, a, a significant entry or public entry into the Christian faith for these people. And for a lot of people, a lot of countries where there is a, an anti-God, anti-Christian element, some of their people can come and they can say, I've converted to Christianity. And the family will live with that. But as soon as that person says that they want to be baptised, that is when literally all hell breaks loose on them. Some to the point where they are never seen again. Because they have made this now a public stand. You see, once the person, they can say they're a Christian. But once they are baptised, it is that public thing. It's that out there. That's why baptisms aren't done in secret. They're not done in private. They're done in a very public way. So is it, there is a testimony that I am Christ's and Christ's mine. And to be rather crass, come hell or high water, that's how it's going to be. Nothing's going to change that. And it's that public stand, that, that affirmation, that makes it so dangerous in many places for a person to say, not only am I a Christian, but I'm going to demonstrate that in baptism. You see, the Lord isn't just looking for us to sign a decision card. And although a sinner's prayer can get us into the kingdom of God and get us into a relationship with Him, it's when people make their wholehearted stand and say, this is what I want to do. I want to be obedient. I want to grow. I want to be a, a public disciple of Jesus Christ. Not only was it uh, demanded in the, in the Gospels, it's also demonstrated in Acts. And each one of those illustrations or examples, we're not going to, to read the text for each of them, but on the day of Pentecost, after 3,000 people had declared their faith in Jesus Christ, they were baptized. 
That raises the question, of course, of who does the baptizing. And there's nothing in the scripture that says the baptism must be conducted by a particular person with a particular ranking in the church. If you're going to baptize 3,000 people in one day, I, it's only speculation, I, I've got no, no record of it, but I have a hunch that as one person was baptized, they called the next person in and baptized. So now you had two people baptizing, and then you had four people baptizing. So baptized believers were baptizing believers. And so they were able to do 3,000 in one day. That would have been there a long time. It was just left to one or two of the apostles to have done that. So it was, was um, for Paul, for Cornelius, for Lydia, for the Philippian jailer, for the Twelve and, and Ephesians, uh, in Ephesus rather, that was all part of a demonstration in act of this is what Jesus said. He said this is what we're to do, and so we're going to do exactly what he has said that we should do. And it's described for us particularly in uh, Romans, and Julia read for us some of those verses from Romans chapter 6, so we won't read them again here now. But in, in Romans chapter 6, Paul is really taking the picture and saying, this is what it's about. It's, it's immersion. You go under the water, you go down, and you come up. And his whole purpose of that is saying that it is symbolic of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. The only way you can do that as a believer, it typically, is by going under and coming back up again. Who should be baptized? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. The person who is going to be baptized is the person who has come into a clear understanding that they have made a decision to be a disciple of Jesus. They have gone from darkness into light spiritually, from spiritual death to spiritual life. There has been a total transformation that has taken place. And I appreciated that Jade and Julia were talking about the transformation that's taken place in their hearts and in their lives. It started to be demonstrated. It started to become visible to each other and to the community that something has happened here, something of absolute significance. And that is in the, in the relation to their faith in Jesus Christ. A few years ago in a previous church we were in, there was one of the young ladies who was the daughter of an elder, came to the elders and said that she wanted to be baptised again. And this came as a real surprise to the elders, and particularly because her father was also on, on the eldership. And we talked to her about it and said, well, you know, you've been baptised once, you don't need to be baptised again. She said, I do. Because when I was baptized first, I was not a Christian. I was not a disciple. I went along with the group, the young people being baptized, and so I thought, I should do that because I'm part of a Christian family. I think it's what you're supposed to do. But she said, I came to the point of recognizing that I was not a believer. I hadn't made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And I want to make a public stand now of the fact that I am now in Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. And that was a, that was a testimony that Jay used. That, that's part of what was his experience. The old went and has been continuing to go in relation to his, uh, his walk. The question comes up from time to time too, is what, what, what is the age for baptism, for believers' baptism? And that's a good question, particularly for parents who are Christians. And that's some of you here, here today, and, and you, you've got this question that may come up, if it hasn't come up yet, when, but from your children, what, what is an appropriate age for a child to be baptised? Again, there is nothing in the scripture that says it must be at a certain age. It can't be before then, it can be after, after then. The clearest way in which I could describe that is when a child can voluntarily give a testimony to the fact that they have become a disciple of Jesus. They want to follow him. And that they understand that baptism is a public declaration of them saying to their parents, to their peers, to the church community, to anybody who's there, that as a, a 10 year old, a 9 year old, a 13 year old child, I want to follow Jesus. If they can do that, you know, I, I, there's a tremendous responsibility here on parents. Firstly, 
to not, uh, not discourage that. To not say you're too young. Let it, let it pass. You know, when you're a little bit older, you'll be all right. Because I've known of cases where that has happened and the child has never come back to that point. They're too young because they haven't really experienced life yet. What if they get baptized at, at 9 or 10 and at about 15 or 16 they start to go off the tracks? Listen folks, that's a discipleship issue at that point. It's not an obedience issue. If a child wants to be baptized, if they want to be obedient to Christ, for me, I would err on the side of baptizing and take the questions that come up and the lifestyles and the challenges that come up in life afterwards as discipleship issues and, and walk with them on that. And you can talk to them then in terms of you made a commitment, you were obedient to Christ back then. So now's the time to be obedient again. Romans 10 and 9 is, if we confess with our mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we're saved. And if a child can declare that, then they can be baptized. Why is it necessary? In John chapter 14 and verse 21, and this has come up already in David and Julia's testimonies today. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. And we read from John chapter, uh, Matthew 28 and verse 20, and teaching, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. You see, baptism in itself is an act of obedience. And an act of obedience is saying to Jesus, I love you. I really, I, I love what you've done for me. You've died on the cross for me. You've paid my penalty. As Jay said, the cross was his cross. He was my substitute. He was our substitute. We should have been there, but he took our place. I honour you for that, I worship you for that, I love you for that. And I love you enough to be obedient to what you have asked me to do. So it, it is an act of obedience, following an act of conversion, an act of, of faith, of accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. It's easy, it's easy for somebody to make the first step, and easier to make the first step, it's sometimes more difficult to make the second step. And I guess I have over the years heard just about every excuse imaginable for why we shouldn't be putting it off or why people want to want to put it off. But if we want to be obedient, we want to acknowledge that we love Jesus, then we need to be obedient in his step of faith. See, baptism, baptism doesn't save us. Baptism, baptism doesn't make me sinless. But when I'm baptized, when I'm a Christian, I want to sin less. I lose the passion for sin. I lose the desire to want to follow after the old ways. And I gain a fresh hunger and a fresh desire to follow after Jesus. His word becomes more real to me. Prayer becomes more significant to me. The fellowship with other Christians, whatever, whatever age group, my peers, your peers, becomes more significant for you. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians First Corinthians rather says bad company corrupts good morals and once you start to recognize that as a follower of Jesus you start to want to pull away from bad company so that you will walk faithfully with Jesus it doesn't mean to say you're not going to have you, you need to shun non-Christian friends that's, that's not what it's saying <coughs> but you don't let their lifestyle now start to dominate your lifestyle and to follow and to, and to be led away by him by them so folks today we have witnessed two baptisms. Today we've seen J.J. and Julian declare their total faith and total commitment in Jesus. And I think back, every time I come to a baptism, I think of going to a little church in the middle of Frankton, which is a suburb of Hamilton, for, for those who haven't sort of visited way up that end of it. As a 15-year-old, going into into the baptism, I think it was about 1960, I've got a mark in my Bible, so a few years ago now. But every baptism reminds me again of that day, of that commitment, of what I stood for then. And it's a challenge to me, is, is that what I still stand for today? Do I still love Jesus that much today? Am I still willing to be as obedient to Him today as I was then? And folks, this morning, if, if you're a believer and you've been baptized, I trust that as you've seen Jay and Julia baptized and you've reflected again on that day in your life, let it bring joy again. Let it bring a sense of inspiration again 
into what your walk with Jesus can be like. And if you haven't come to that point yet, and perhaps this may have been the first time you've seen a baptism, and it's raised sort of questions in your mind as to, to what really, do I really, should I, when should I, then we would encourage you to keep inquiring. But see it as a point of obedience, as a point of public declaration of this is where I am now with Jesus. Jane and Julia, God bless you as you continue to walk with Him, as you raise your family to know Him, to love Him, to follow in those same footsteps. You've got parents that want to nurture you and worship with you and lead you in that path as well. And you are a family that is blessed. And we want to continue to pray for you and walk with you as you are part of, part of our fellowship here at the White House. Let us pray. Father, these are great days. These are the times when we can just celebrate with those who are, are, are celebrating, rejoice with those who are rejoicing. We know that your heart is lifted today. There's a smile in, in your face today as you look down on this little group of people here, part of your church, and uh, celebrating the life, the baptism of, of two wonderful people. Today, Father, we pray that that might be an ongoing experience for them. And that we might become ever faithful to you, ever faithful to your word, ever faithful to accepting the challenges of it, and growing in our love for you, and our love to, to serve you, and to go after everything that is yours. So we thank you for today. We thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.